Chapter 4 The Palace of Queen Aquarine. Trot was surprised to find it was not all dark or gloomy as they descended farther into the deep sea. Things were not quite so clear to her eyes as they had been in the bright sunshine above the ocean surface, but every object was distinct nevertheless, as if she saw it through a pane of green tinted glass. The water was very clear except for this green shading, and the little girl had never before felt so light and buoyant as she did now. It was no effort at all to dart through the water, which seemed to support her on all sides. I don't believe I weigh anything at all, she told Captain Bill. No more do I, Trot, said he. But that's natural, seeing as we're underwater so far. What bothers me most is how we manage to breathe, having no gills like fishes have. Are you sure we haven't any gills? She asked, lifting her free hand to feel her throat. Sure. Nor the mermaids haven't any either, declared Cap'n Bill. Then, said Trot, we're breathing by magic. The mermaids laughed at this shrewd remark, and the princess said, You have guessed correctly, my dear. Go a little slower now, for the palaces are in sight. Where? asked Trot eagerly. Just before you. In that grove of trees, inquired the girl, and really it seemed to her they were approaching a beautiful grove. The bottom of the sea was covered with white sand in which grew many varieties of she shrubs with branches like those of trees. Not all of them were green, however, for the branches and leaves were of a variety of gorgeous colors. Some were purple, shading down to light lavender, and there were reds all the way from a delicate rose pink to vivid shades of scarlet. Orange, yellow, and blue shades were there too, mingling with the sea greens in a most charming manner. Altogether, Trot found the brilliant coloring somewhat bewildering. These she shrubs, which in size were quite as big and tall as the trees on earth, were set so close together that their branches entwined. But there were several avenues leading into the groves, and at the entrance to each avenue the girl noticed several large fishes with long spikes growing upon their noses. These are swordfishes, remarked the princess as she led the band past one of these avenues. Are they dangerous? asked Trot. Not to us, was the reply. The swordfishes are among our most valued and faithful servants, guarding the entrance to the gardens which surround our palaces. If any creature tries to enter uninvited, these guards fight them and drive them away. Their swords are sharp and strong, and they are fierce fighters, I assure you. I've known them to attack ships and stick their swords right through the wood, said Captain Bill. Those belong to the wandering tribes of swordfishes, explained the princess. These, who are our servants, are too sensible and intelligent to attack ships. The band now headed into a broad passage through the gardens, as the mermaids called these gorgeous groves, and the great swordfishes guarding the entrance made way for them to pass, afterward resuming their post with round and watchful eyes. As they slowly swam along the avenue, Trot noticed that some of the bushes seemed to have fruits growing upon them. But what these fruits might be, neither she nor Captain Bill could guess. The way round here and there for some distance, till finally they came to a more open space, all carpeted with sea flowers of exquisite colorings. Although Trot did not know it, these flowers resembled the rare orchids of earth in their fanciful shapes and marvelous hues. The child did not examine them very closely, for across the carpet of flowers loomed the magnificent and extensive palaces of the mermaids. These palaces were built of coral, white, pink, and yellow being used, and the colors arranged in graceful designs. The front of the main palace, which now faced them, had circular ends connecting the straight wall, not unlike the architecture we are all familiar with. Yet there seemed to be no windows to the buildings, although a series of archways served as doors. Arriving at one of the central archways, the band of sea maidens separated. Princess Clea and Merla, leading Trot and Cap'n Bill into the palace, while the other mermaids swam swiftly away to their own quarters. Welcome, said Clea in her sweet voice. Here you are surrounded only by friends and are in perfect safety. 
Please accept our hospitality as freely as you desire, for we consider you honored guests. I hope you will like our home, she added a little shyly. We are sure to, dear princess, Trot hastened to say. Then Clea escorted them through the archway and into a lofty hall. It was not a mere grotto, but had smoothly built walls of pink coral inlaid with white. Trot at first thought there was no roof, for looking upward she could see the water all above them, but the princess reading her thoughts said with a smile, Yes, there is a roof, or we would be unable to keep all the sea people out of our palace, but the roof is made of glass to admit the light. Glass, cried this astonished child, then it must be an awful big pane of glass. It is, agreed Clea. Our roofs are considered quite wonderful, and we owe them to the fairy powers of our queen. Of course, you understand there is no natural way to make glass underwater. No, indeed, said Cap'n Bill. And then he asked, does your queen live here? Yes, she is waiting now in her throne room to welcome you. Shall we go in? I'd just as soon, replied Trot rather timidly, but she boldly followed the princess, who glided through another arch into a small room where several mermaids were reclining upon couches of coral. They were beautifully dressed and wore many sparkling jewels. Her Majesty is awaiting the strangers, Princess Clea announced to one of these. You are asked to enter at once. Come then, said Clea, and once more taking Trot's hand, she led the girl through still another arch while Merla followed just behind them, escorting Cap'n Bill. They now entered an apartment so gorgeous that the child fairly gasped with astonishment. The queen's throne room was indeed the grandest and most beautiful chamber in all the ocean palaces. Its coral walls were thickly inlaid with mother of pearl, exquisitely shaded and made into borders and floral decorations. In the corners were cabinets upon the shelves, of which many curious shelves were arranged, all beautifully polished. The floor glittered with gems arranged in patterns of flowers like a brilliant carpet. Near the center of the room was a raised platform of mother of pearl, upon which stood a couch thickly studded with diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and pearls. Here reclined Queen Aquarine a being so lovely that Trot gazed upon her spellbound, and Cap'n Bill took off his sailor cap and held it in his hands. All about the room were grouped other mother-of-pearl couches, not raised like that of the queen, and upon which each of these reclined a pretty mermaid. They could not sit down as we do, Trot readily understood, because of their tails, but they rested very gracefully upon the couches, with their trailing gauzy robes arranged in fleecy folds. When Clea and Merla escorted the strangers down the length of the great room toward the royal throne, they met with pleasant looks and smiles on every side, for the sea maidens were too polite to indulge in curious stares. They paused just before the throne, and the queen raised her head upon one elbow to observe them. Welcome, Mary, she said, and welcome, Cap'n Bill. I trust you are pleased with your glimpse of the life beneath the surface of the sea. I am, answered Trot, looking admiringly at the beautiful face of the queen. It's all my curious and strange-like, said the sailor slowly. I'd no idea you mermaids were like this at all. Allow me to explain that it was to correct your wrong ideas about us that led us to invite you to this visit, replied the queen. We usually pay little heed to the earth people, for we are content in our own dominions. But of course, we know all that goes on upon your earth. So when Princess Clea chanced to overhear your absurd statements concerning us, we were greatly amused and decided to let you see with your own eyes just what we are like. I'm glad you did, answered Cap'n Bill, dropping his eyes in some confusion as he remembered his former description of the mermaids. Now that you are here, continued the queen in a cordial, friendly tone, you may as well remain with us a few days and see the wonderful sights of our ocean. I'm much obliged to you, ma'am, said Trot, and I'd like to stay ever so much, but mother worries just dreadful if we don't get home in time. I'll arrange all that, said Aquarine with a smile. How? asked the girl. I will make your mother forget the passage of time so she will not realize how long you are away. Then she cannot worry. 
Can you do that? inquired Trot. Very easily. I will send your mother into a deep sleep that will last until you are ready to return home. Just at present, she is seated in her chair by the front window, engaged in knitting. The queen paused to raise an arm and wave it slowly to and fro. Then she added, Now your good mother is asleep, little Mary, and instead of worries, I promise her pleasant dreams. Won't somebody rob the house while she's asleep? asked the child anxiously. No, dear. My charm will protect the house from any intrusion. That's fine, exclaimed Trot in delight. It's just wonderful, said Cap'n Bill. I wish I knew it was so. Trot's mother has an awful sharp tongue when she's worried. You may see for yourselves, declared the queen and waved her hand again. At once they saw before them the room in the cottage with Mary's mother asleep by the window. Her knitting was in her lap and the cat lay curled upon her, up beside her. It was all so natural that Trot thought she could hear the clock over the fireplace tick. After a moment, the scene faded away when the queen asked with another smile, are you satisfied? Oh yes, cried Trot, but how could you do it? It is a form of mirage, was the reply. We are able to bring any earth scene before us whenever we wish. Sometimes these scenes are reflected above the water so that mortals also observe them. I've seen them, said Cap'n Bill, nodding. I've seen mirages, but I never knowed what caused them before now. Whenever you see anything you do not understand and wish to ask questions, I will be very glad to answer them, said the queen. One thing that bothers me, said Trot, is why we don't get wet being in the ocean with water all around us. That is because no water really touches you, explained the queen. Your bodies have been made just like those of the mermaids in order that you may fully enjoy your visit to us. One of our peculiar qualities is that water is never permitted to quite touch our bodies or our gowns. Always there remains a very small space, hardly a hair's breadth between us and the water, which is the reason we are always warm and dry. I see said Trot. That's why you don't get soggy or withered. Exactly, laughed the queen, and the other mermaids joined in her merriment. I suppose that's how we can breathe without gills, remarked Cap'n Bill thoughtfully. Yes, the air space is constantly replenished from the water, which contains air, and this enables us to breathe as freely as you do upon the earth. But we have fins, said Trot, looking at the fin that stood upright on Cap'n Bill's back. Yes, they allow us to guide ourselves as we swim, and so are very useful, replied the queen. They make us more finished, said Cap'n Bill with a chuckle. Then he suddenly became grave. He asked, how about my rheumatics, ma'am? Ain't I likely to get stiffened up with all this dampness? No, indeed, Aquarine answered. There is no such thing as rheumatism in all our dominions. I promise no evil result shall follow this visit to us. So please be as happy and contented as possible. 